Well, hello there. I'm hoping people are tuning in. I am uh, drinking my celebratory cup of, um, in this case, bubbly. I made myself a little celebratory drink. That's not actually tea. <laughs> tea is not that color, at least not the kind of tea that I drink. <laughs> hello. Hello, everyone. Oh, it's so nice to see you all. Uh, so, happy book birthday to me. <laughs> um, yay, you're all there. So I did a little test ahead of time and there might have been a bit of lagging, but I rebooted my router. So I hope you all can hear me and that my voice is synced up all right. Strong connection. Yay, book. Thank you very much. Good to know. Rebooting the router seems to be the trick. <laughs> so, it's our launch party day for uh, Defy or Defend. Note I'm wearing a cute little dress that is the same color because it's me. That's what I had to do. <laughs> um, so, I hope you all are joining me to celebrate. Uh, I have a little champagne mixed with strawberry soda. And uh, instead of tea, it's, it's a little late for me. And I've been drinking too much caffeine recently, so I've switched from caffeine to booze. Hmm, not sure about that decision, but there it is. That's the decision I've made. Uh, I had a tasty little puff pastry. I wouldn't um, insult you all by eating in front of you, uh, but that's what I had to celebrate. And um, yes, so let me know what you're drinking or eating to celebrate in a, in a comment. I'd love to know. And everyone is clocking in and saying where they're tuning in from as well, which is wonderful. I know it's pretty late in Australia and New Zealand, but since they are a day ahead, they did get the book early because it drops when it drops in the, in the time zone. So if you've seen people posting about having read it already, they probably come from a part of the world that is in the future. <laughs> uh, and also Borderlands, uh, for those of you who ordered a signed edition from Borderlands, they I gave them permission to ship immediately because don't know what's going on with the postal service right now. So I wanted to make sure that there was a that the book would um, arrive to you guys as soon as possible, and so did they. And that means a few people also got the physical edition uh, maybe a day early. But, technically speaking, this is the book. It is out today in some places, tomorrow everywhere else. Um, and it's widely available now in digital and print. And uh, secretly, maybe, perhaps, audio. But you'll have to get uh, the cheer up tomorrow morning to find out more about that. <laughs> um, from the belly of the beast, says Lindsay in Brooklyn. Oh, sweetheart, I hope you're all right. Oh, I hope I I hope everybody's all right. Uh, I did not plan it this way, obviously, because I wrote this book quite a long time ago. Um, that's the way the publishing industry works, right? I wrote, I wrote it about a year ago, uh, maybe six months. But um, this is probably one of the most cheerful books I've ever written. So. Hopefully, uh, because it's Dimity's book, obviously, so it's full of bright colors and sparkles and happiness and silliness and some some stealthy doings, of course. Um, so hopefully, it will cheer you up. That's uh, that's what I'm hoping for. Um, accidentally cheer you up, <laughs> but it is definitely a, a return return to form for me in in light of like um, you know the first series that I wrote. Any hoozle, well, you all uh, um, natter away and think about questions you're gonna have for me. I thought I would do something I don't do very often, but I thought I would read a little bit to you. I know um, I don't have a British accent, so you'll have to forgive me that. Emma, my reader, does a brilliant job <laughs> with her readings. Um, but I like this book a lot, and so I know there are people out there who really like to hear the words in the author's voice. So I thought I'd just read you a little bit of the first chapter, which is actually Crispian's point of view, the love interest, Sir Crispian. Um, and that way that gives everyone a chance to tune in. You can hear what the words sound like in my head. And, uh, and then I'll take some questions afterwards. So that's the plan. Um, so save your questions till then. And remember, uh, if you have a question, try to put the question mark at the beginning. That way when I'm scanning through the comments, I know that it's a question. 
So here we are. Defy or defend. Settle in, get your tea at the ready. She says spilling her champagne on herself. Um, well, it's a christening from a book. Defy or defend by moi. Chapter one. In which there may or may not be sparkles. March 1869, just prior to the introduction of the bustle. No, really, it's important that you know this. Sir Crispian Bontui chivied up to an impressively large chartreuse front door with a sense of overwhelming relief. Not because the color of the door, mind you, which, which, which was a touch assertive, frankly, for a door, what did it think it was playing at, but because of the possibilities that lay behind it. The door opened, and the possibilities proved themselves to be a female of biblical proportions and eccentric dress. She was that particular style of solid British womanhood that held firm against both military invasion and recalcitrant pie crusts, rolling pin wielded with consummate skill in either case. Sir Crispian knew her of old. He bowed slightly, and hid his grin, because both the woman and the door demanded respect. My dear madam, what a pleasure to see you again. It's you, is it? Mrs. Bagley pursed her lips to hide her delight and threw the door wide. At your service. He strode inside, fairly vibrating with suppressed excitement. It had been ages since his last mission. He was restless with the need to f fix something or rescue someone or perhaps both. Today, Mrs. Bagley was dressed like a butler. She looked rather dashing, truth be told. Her cravat was chartreuse, to match the door, and her striped waistcoat was cut to perfection. Chris was mildly perturbed by the fact that trousers suited her demeanor better than they did most men of his acquaintance. It could have been worse. Mrs. Bagley had once answered the door dressed as a yellow butterfly. Or was it a moth? Regardless, a winged cape had been involved. One was never certain what exactly Bertie's housekeeper would be wearing on any given occasion. It was one of the most exciting things about visiting Bertie's household. I've been summoned, madam. Chris always referred to Mrs. Bagley as madam. Mrs. Bagley suited her ill, and anything more informal from Chris would cause a one-woman riot. Mrs. Bagley took meticulous handling. He didn't envy Bertie. Mrs. Bagley widened her eyes at him in pretend shock. Summoned, worthy you indeed. Wipe your feet, young man. Chris was already wiping them. Mrs. Bagley's favorite thing was to give orders she knew were already being obeyed. She didn't even pause for breath. A new mission, is it? Now, madam, I can't discuss such things with you, even if I've had an inkling. Chris drew himself up, but only a little wouldn't do to loom over a woman of Mrs. Bagley's consequence. As you are very well aware, I'll hear about it later. Of course you will, although I'm not supposed to know that. I must say, it's a good thing you're on our side. Oops, did the voices wrong there. Mrs. Bagley is the one who says she'll know about it later. Sorry. This is why I don't read. <clears throat> he twitched towards the hallway, needing to move past niceties onto useful activity. Are you sure about that? She pretended a wicked glare. I live in fear, dear madam, we all do. No doubt, the fate of the war office rests upon your discretion. Now, where is he? In the conservatory, of course. Is he ever anywhere else? Mrs. Bagley marched off. Chris strode eagerly after her, careful not to overtake her. It was pleasing to trail behind a woman who walked like she had places to be and people to kill. The hallway was scrupulously clean and well-maintained, despite the fact that the walls were lined with hundreds of tiny drawers topped by glass-fronted curio cases. There might just possibly have been wallpaper behind it all, but no one would ever know. Bertie was a dedicated dilettante, who picked up and put down interests obsessively. They walked past a beautifully mounted collection of wooden ladles, not spoons, ladles, and a display of Bertie's own taxidermic caterpillars. It was a little like the Natural History Museum, only more eclectic. 
and with no apparent curation or connection between one case and the next. Chris was so accustomed to the spectacle, he barely glanced at the curiosities. Mrs. Bagley paused mid-hallway, much to his frustration, and turned on Chris, contorting her face into one of concern. It didn't work well, as she was not a particularly sympathetic person, so her face went a little twitchy with the effort. Most distressing to hear about your father, Sir Crispian. I am sorry for your loss. What Chris wanted to say was, hang my father. Everyone I know is delighted that he's dead. But one didn't do that to a housekeeper, especially not Mrs. Bagley. Plus, as an Englishman, Crispian didn't like making other people uncomfortable with real feelings. So he drew his own face into an expression of sorrow and said politely, Thank you kindly, madam. Niceties observed, the housekeeper marched on, eventually opening the double doors to the conservatory with a jerk. Then, because it would take too long to find him amongst all the plants, she raised her voice in the manner of a governess and yelled into the teeming verdancy, Bertie, you blighter! Sir Crispian is here to see you! Bertie was undergoing a cactus stage, had been for near on a year now. It was getting increasingly prickly at his house, particularly in the conservatory. Accordingly, Bertie appeared from behind a large, fluffy bit of shrubbery, clutching a pot from which protruded a small, round cactus with a single bright pink flower. It so closely resembled a hedgehog wearing a hat that Chris was mildly startled not to see it sprout little legs and waddle off. Crispy, my dear fellow, what a lovely surprise to see you. You summoned me, Bertie. Chris spread his hands wide in supplication. Did I? How very peculiar of me. Have you met an Echoconiatris elegomenii? Before, isn't it a remarkable? This one has just flowered. I think it's rather jolly, don't you? It looks like a hedgehog in a hat. Chris was one for honesty when it didn't matter or hurt anybody's feelings. Then he turned off, took off his own hat and looked for a place to put it. There wasn't one, so it put it back on his head. He would never dare give it to Mrs. Bagley. Fantastic, I say. I shall name it Robesmere. Note the shortness of the internode just there. No, don't touch nasty things, cacti. Now, let me tell you, one of the most remarkable things about them is the areoles. You see this bit here? Mrs. Bagley interrupted him, crimson-faced. Really, Bertie, Sir Crispian is suffering a great loss at the moment. Do stop prattling on at the poor fellow. Really? What's he lost? Bertie had a large straight nose, beady dark eyes, and a wide smiling mouth. He had unfortunately fine hair, close cut, that had gone gray when they were at university together and begun a brave retreat some years later, so that he now resembled a surprised but cuddly mongoose. He mostly acted like one, too, chattering and familiar, unless a snake was about. Then he proved quite deadly. His father, you nubbin, Mrs. Bagley indicated Crispian's morning attire with a flick of two fingers. Chris would have preferred Bertie continue on in ignorance and get to the mission, but Mrs. Bagley was clearly having none of it. Bertie, a true friend, instantly forgot about the cactus and its areoles and dashed forward to cr clutch one of Crispian's hands in his own waving the cactus about dangerously with the other. My dear Crispy, forgive me. I entirely forgot. Do come in, sit down, sit down. Oh, there isn't anywhere to sit, is there? Wait a moment. Eudora, would you be a dove and move those whatever they are off that bench thing, seat thing me there? Yes, yes, I know it's business. We ought to be in the study, but I don't feel right leaving the elegomani alone right now, not when it's in the midst of flowering for the first time might put it off. You understand, don't you, Eudora? No, you don't, do you? Well, Crispy understands, don't you, old chap? There, see. Sit down, do. Chris sat, minding his posture, and trying desperately to sit still, while Mrs. Bagley scowled affectionately and made room for both of them. Bertie plonked down next to Chris, cactus on his lap. Crispy, my dear fellow, you do look peaky. You must be terribly worn down. The funeral was ghastly, I suspect. Utterly. All of my sisters were there. All of them.
Chris shuddered to recall his trying morning. They enjoyed themselves tremendously, of course, wept a great deal, even wailed once in a while. London now has a decided surfeit of damp handkerchiefs. He'd not seen the like since his brother's funeral when they'd all been much younger, with more excuses for pejorative histrionics. One might hope sisters would have grown out of such things, or at least cry less for a lesser man. Apparently not. Bertie looked imploringly at his housekeeper. Might we have tea, please, Eudora, my dove? I ask not for me, but for my dear bereaved friend. Mrs. Bagley rolled her eyes and left the conservatory without comment. Bertie turned back to Chris. Are the sisters still trying to marry you off? Desperately. They even brought prospects to the funeral. And we'll leave it there. Dun, dun, dun. So that sets up Crispian, who is uh, Dimity's love interest, uh, clearly uh, bereaved, although not really, by a, a, um, the recent death of his father. And of course, his father plays greatly into his uh, various psychoses um, and needs and requirements. And uh, yes, then uh, Dimity is introduced in the next scene, but you all know Dimity, I'm sure. Right. Uh, so, yes, and now you have an excellent example of why I don't narrate my own audiobooks. Um, I can be animated about it, and it is kind of fun to hear an author's voice in their own voice, but um, it isn't my strong point. I can't, I can't really do voices. I'm never, never very good at acting or anything like that. So, and I think you really need to be skilled to be a narrator. Um... Hello from Boise, Idaho. Hello, Boise, Idaho. Uh, hello, everybody, all of the world. I think there are some of you very far away, very late at night. <laughs> and others of you possibly even further, very early in the morning. I'm not sure. Uh, this is the beauty of the, uh, the live video feed. Uh, it, don't worry, I always uh, leave the video up if you missed the reading, and it will also go on YouTube. And uh, even though I'm embarrassed about it, <laughs> you can rewatch it there. But now, uh, I'm ready to do some uh, gossiping, uh, take a, a Q&A, um, that sort of a deal. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, I always appreciate it if you put a, a question mark at the beginning of the comment, that way I... I know it's for me, and not chatter back and forth, since I just see a stream of comments on my screen. Um, if you're watching this later and you want to leave a comment, you should do so. I try to go back and double check and make sure I've answered everybody's questions. So uh, if you're watching on YouTube or what have you, please, please also leave a comment. Lavender has a question. Do I have any suggestions for nonfiction fun reads like Mary Roach's? Oh, that is a very, um, that's a very good question, actually. So I don't read a lot of nonfiction. I can say this is going to come as a weird recommendation, but I do recommend it. I find it quite comforting, actually. There is a book called The World Without Us, written by a journalist, who goes, who hypothesizes that the entire human race is wiped out by a plague. What would happen to our buildings, to nuclear power stations, that sort of thing? And so he basically goes around and interviews scientists and archaeologists, etc., about what that what that world would look like, what the world would look like if we were to suddenly abandon it. Um, and it's a really it's an older nonfiction piece, but I very much enjoyed that book. Um, I tend to read nonfiction in fits and starts, though, as in the book itself. So I will read a couple chapters, put it down, read a couple chapters, put it down over the course of a week or a month. So I don't know if it stands up to like a, a full read as a nonfiction book, but that's one I would recommend. I'm sorry, I don't remember the author's name, but it's A World Without Us. I think it was also made into a documentary of some kind. And then... Um, Another book I really like is an old book, and some of the history is a little, um, is a little outdated, hmm, in more ways than one. <laughs> um, but it is a fantastic kind of sweeping look at the medieval to enlightenment transmission transition period of human history in the Western world, um, and it is called A World Lit Only by Fire which is a great title. Um, and I just find it a very, I thought it was a very cerebral and but 
consumable and easy easy I listened to it as an audiobook and it was fantastic so um, I guess those would be my two recommendations um, these days when I read nonfictions it's mostly like business books and you know like I have to learn vellum soon so I'm gonna be reading books about vellum <laughs> you know like not very exciting or interesting stuff South Australia at 7.45 a.m. Karen. Karen is tuning in very early in the morning. Thank you. <laughs> Amanda says, if I'll be coming back to San Diego for a book signing anytime soon. Well, no. <laughs> Nobody's going anywhere right now. Um, we're shelter in place here in the Bay Area for another month. Uh, but I do like San Diego and I love to get down there and I have very very dear and darling friends some of whom are watching um, right now down in the San Diego area so um, I, I have no doubt I will be back there uh, but it doesn't look like I'm doing really so I have a tentative convention at the very end of the year in October in Canada in Halifax so for my any Canadian watchers out there, there's a strange place. Uh, I chose it because I've never been there before, in part, and because they invited me. Um, but again, I'm not sure. Hopefully things will be back at least partly up and running by then. But I don't know for large conventions and gatherings whether they will even happen throughout the rest of this year. Um, but that's my next, uh, that's my only travel this year right now. Um, everything else is, is off, off the table. Uh, Roslyn wants to know how the Enforcer Enigma is coming along. The Enforcer Enigma is my next release after this one, so, uh, or it's my next fiction book after this one. Um, it is, where, at what stage are we at? Oh, it just came back on Friday from my developmental editor, um, who sent me a couple pages of revisions. So then I go into revisions. Then I reach out to my copy editor. Oh, then I reach out to my beta readers. They take a look at it and then it goes to my copy editor. So it's uh, it's moving along. I um I'm always terrified, like just terrified by developmental edit letters. Um I think just because they show me all of my flaws and as a writer and also um everything I have to rewrite. <laughs> so it's just like it is a letter of a workload basically. So I haven't looked at the letter yet. Uh, it's sitting in my inbox and I am saving it until Monday. I was like, mm, got a book to launch into the world first. So we'll think about the next one when I get into the, come, come to the office on Monday. So yeah, <laughs> that's where we are with Enforcer Enigma. There's a hello from Ontario and a hello from Berlin. And Angelica wants to know if this is my version of the pink slurp. Yes, yes it is. Champagne and strawberry juice in this case. Since we are at the start of strawberry season, um, fruit juice is fresh. Fruit juice is from fruits that we don't think about juicing in the States are really common in Peru. So like passion fruit juice, and I'm not talking sweetened canned stuff. I'm talking freshly squeezed, um, but also strawberry juice. Uh, and so I just love fresh juice. I maybe shouldn't get myself a juicer at some point uh, when I have a bigger kitchen maybe in my future retirement years. Robin asks if the chartreuse door is a throwback to the Pickleman. I don't think so. Um, could be. But Bertie, if he was a Pickleman, isn't anymore. Um, and he's clearly not very uh, gadgetly minded. Um, sorry, it's, it's remarkably cold today. I'm going to uh, throw on my, my fur. Um... Do, do, do. Besides, the Pickleman are sort of bright green, or, you know, Pickleman green. Uh, Chloe asks, how would I feel about Amy Lou Wood as Dimity? Oh, she plays Amy in Sex Education. I can sort of see that. Um, I'm trying to remember that character. Uh, I'm terrible with names, uh, but yeah. Um, the cast on that show is so excellent. I could see any of them being, being different characters. Um, Clara asks what the time frame is of the new book, and, uh, the time frame is, as it says at the very beginning, March 1869. 
Um, uh, just prior to the introduction of the bustle, no really, it's important to know this. <laughs> so that is the date, March 1869, which means it's about two years after Poison or Protect and about four years before Soulless. So it fits in that gap between the finishing school and the um, Parasol Protectorate. And I am, with the Delightfully Deadly books so far have all fit into that gap and I am kind of doing it on purpose. But the next Delightfully Deadly book is gonna span many, many years. So it will have something, events that occur during that gap and I will probably open it during that time frame. But it's gonna go from after finishing school all the way to like the Custer Protocol to the 1890s. So, um, so yes. But this one is 69. If you want to look up the, you know, the the dresses at the time. Amanda wants to know when the next San Andreas book is coming out. Right now, I am tentatively scheduled to release the Enforcer Enigma in the fall. Um, but I'm thinking about changing that uh, so you know it's a case of watch the space uh, keep an eye to the chirrup the chirrup will know more that's my newsletter I will reveal all <laughs> in the chirrup um, I am scrolling through to see if there are other questions there's a question Stein asks do I have a favorite LGBT themed book as in the the um, sexual identity of the main characters is the mainstay of the plot, like a coming out book or something like that, or just books in which the characters happen to be queer? Because I feel like there is a difference. Um, I have a lot, I read mostly queer romances right now. They're one of my comfort reads, so I've been reading a lot of those. Um, do I have a favorite one? There are some like great, epic fantasy ones. It, it, it would be hard for me to pin a favorite down. Um, I love uh, Lynn Gala's Claimings series and also her Earth Fathers Are Weird. They're both sci-fi. I've been like gravitating to sci-fi right now for some reason. Just, you know, you I always go through waves when I'm reading. So, you know, if I had to pull off the top of my head, it would probably be one of those right now. But if you Google my name and then queer sci-fi or queer fantasy, um, then a bunch of recommendations will come up and, you know, you can scroll through and see if any of them appeal to you. Um, but yeah, that's one of, one I've been comfort reading recently is Lynn Gala, L-Y-N-G-A-L-A. She's great. Um, Amanda wants to know who my favorite character to write so far, like in all of the characters I've ever written. That's so hard. <laughs> Well, clearly I love Lord Akeldama because he shows up in everything, um, and yes, he shows up in this book. Uh, there's a Lord Akeldama moment, don't be afraid, uh, because he always seems to show up. I can't keep him out. Um, but I have lots of characters that I love I, writing. I tend to gravitate towards the characters that are easy for me to write, like they came really comfortably to me, for example. Um, and you'll see me revisit those ones. So like, like Bumbersnoot shows up again because I loved writing Bumbersnoot in the Finishing School series. Um, like, so Imogen was a really great character because I struggled for a long time to write Madame LeFou's book. And that was because I kept trying to write her POV. And I, f I think I'm just too close to her. So I needed to write, I needed to find the character to tell that story. Um, and that turned out to be Imogen. So when I found Imogen, I was super excited about it. Um, Channing's really fun to write. I like Channing and Pressure were both great fun because it was really fun for me to write characters that are really not sympathetic, that a lot of people don't like, and then to try and make you guys like, like make the readers like them. And so really plumbing the depths of why they act the way they act is fun as an author. So I enjoyed both of those too. So those are a couple of my favorites. I mean, Dimitri's a joy and Crispian is a darling, like in this book. He's such a sweetheart. Um, he's such a squ big squishy, um, you know, kind of, he's kind of twitchy. So he's a dancer character. Um, as in like he's a very physical person, so he's kind of always up and down and moving around. 
Um, and that that's just from like I so I used to dance and um, that's just from hanging out with my dancer friends I remember the the like physicality of of people who who are chronic dancers um, so, Yeah, so that was really fun. It's it would be it's just hard for me to pick a favorite um, But it you know if you made me if you forced me to it would probably be Lord Uncle Dama because he always shows up um, that said uh, Max is in the San Andreas series is probably one of my favorites. Max and Marvin are two of my favorites to write. And then there's a new character that is introduced in the Enforcer Enigma called Trick, uh, who is delicious. I, I love Trick to, to bits, so he was a lot of fun. Megan says, how has shelter in place or quarantine helped with your writing process and creativity or not? Um, I think fortunately for me, I'm not in a I'm not in a new creative part of my all of my schedule right now. Um, I think it would be really hard if I were writing a new book right now, but I'm not writing a new book. I'm in a revision phase. I try to schedule things so um, I have large chunks of time to write fresh words because I just work better that way. And so knowing that I had a writing retreat at the beginning of the year and then I was supposed to have a writing retreat in June, I arranged my schedule so that right now I was going to be revising. So I'm revising the heroine's journey for writers, readers, and um, fans of pop culture. That's the nonfiction book. So I've been revising that one right now. And then I'm about to start the big revision pass on the Enforcer Enigma. And I... That's pretty much what I've been doing during the last month and a bit is a, I did a, a self-revision pass on Enforcer before I handed it in. Then after I handed it in, I switched gears and I've been working on the major beta revisions on the heroine's journey. And now it's getting minor secondary beta re revisions. So I'm just kind of like swapping back and forth doing revisions and edits on those two projects, which I can do because one of them is nonfiction and one of them is fiction. Normally I wouldn't muddle like that. Um, but also because it's edit passes and edit passes are a different thing from cr creating new words for me. Um, and I've actually been really grateful that that's what I've had to do right now because I really think I would struggle if I were trying to be creative. That said, um, one of the reasons I schedule myself like this is if I don't write new words, new fiction, new characters, for a month or more, I start to get antsy. And I, I and then I start to get ideas and, and creative. And then scenes start to pop into my head and I start to get excited about new projects. So I will often, often like purposefully diet myself off fiction writing for a while because it helps me get revved back up again and excited up for the next project. And so I've just started, after about a month and a bit, I've just started to have ideas wake me up in the middle of the night and be scribbling things in notebooks and stuff. So I think I'm about ready to start a new project. So I just need to finish out the, the big passes and on the two books I have in production, which are going to go off to editors and stuff. And then I'll probably start laying down the outline for the next fiction book. Don't ask me what that is because I have three ideas right now and I can't decide which one I'm gonna be doing. So uh, I'll let you know when I start writing it, which one it is. Um, it's either the next Delightfully Deadly, the third Delightfully Deadly book, novella, uh, or novel, I don't know which it's gonna be, um, the fourth Sandra's Shifter book, or the second Tinker Stars, um, sci-fi. So I haven't decided. It's one of those three. <laughs> Maybe I'll put it to the vote. I, we'll, we'll see which one burbles to the top and, and has the most cohesive story that I want to start writing. Um, Melinda asks, how many teacups are in my office right now? Mm, Full-sized teacups or demi-tasse teacups? The answer is I've never done a count. Um, four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty, twenty-four, so there's 28 demi tasse teacups, and then there's, I have about six drinking teacups, that's 34. I would say there's about 40 to 50 teacups in my office, but I have been t collecting teacups since I was eight years old, um, and I just became an old fart. So um, I've had a lot of time to collect teacups. People also gift them to me all the time. 
Doc asks if I've heard of Dor Dorothy Edie. No, I have not heard of Dorothy Edie. That was a simple question. Mikey asks, Ah, if I've moved towards deciding on what I might write based on the survey of new projects you asked about. Well, um, part of the reasons I did that survey, for those of you who want to check out the survey or vote, I think it's still open, um, you could you can Google Gail Carragher 16 projects I might write right now, um, aka we don't need your authors don't need your ideas. Um, <laughs> Uh, so one of the reasons I asked that was for ammunition for traditional publishing. Going back to them with new projects, um, it's a lot easier to go back to your publisher with a new idea if you have the backing of, you know, a couple hundred people voting in favor of that idea on your blog, for example. Uh, but traditional publishing has kind of gone crazy right now. Um, very pear-shaped, shall we say, and I just don't know what the landscape of the industry is going to look like at the end of the year. So, uh, those projects that aren't some of the, that aren't one of the three I talked about um, are kind of on the back burner um, right now. What I want to do is write in the those three spaces I've set up. So I've set up. The different novella storylines within the parasol verse and I want to write one of those and then one of the San and then a San Andreas book and then um, something for the Tinkered Stars and those are all independent projects in other words I do the publishing myself for those um, and I want to get a couple more in each of those um, so it'll be another cup I think it'll be at least two years before I look at a traditional publishing contract again in terms of like a young adult series or something completely new and different for me. Um, so that blog post is going to sit there and percolate and collect more votes and everything and we'll see what happens and I might even start adding ideas to it because I've had a few more ideas since then. Um, but yeah, it's just sort of an industry decision at this juncture and I don't know, I don't think the industry knows what's going on and it's very confused. The publishing book industry right now as is as are many many things um, but I I want to wait and see basically um, so yes and I have, I have plenty to keep me occupied in the interim uh, Maria says coming to Nottingham yes uh, Devire Defend takes place in Nottingham Nottingham is where I used to, I went to graduate school so I'm very familiar with the town and I like to do that I like to take my characters to places I know rather well um, and asks again when Enforcer is coming, and the answer is probably in the fall, uh, but I'm not, I don't have a confident date yet because it's not done with its production cycle. Megan wants to know how you become a beta reader. Ah, well, many years ago now, six years ago, I uh, ran a survey on my newsletter, uh, so you had to be a member of my newsletter, and um, I asked them certain questions. And people just thought they were participating in the survey, I think. But really, I was trying to determine whether uh, some beta readers. And now I have a hardcore group of beta readers um, who are very dedicated and whom I love. And unless one of them disappears on me, <laughs> uh, there really isn't openings for other beta readers. Um, I have very specific things that I need from beta readers, which is different from what a lot of authors ask for. Um, I don't mind some copy editing and stuff like that, but that's not what I'm looking for. As a rule, I'm looking for uh, world continuity checkers because I have so many books and so many characters. So I need people who are very familiar with my world. So a lot of my beta readers reread most of my books every year. They're super devoted. Um, they're also very good at using the Wikia because that's my World Bible. For those of you who don't know, I have an online World Bible that is crowdsourced. Um, and it's a wikia, so it's based on the same chassis as Wikipedia. You can just go in and edit. And my beta readers need to be able to reference that regularly. Um, so the the errors that they have caught me in, and they've caught me in several errors, have been um, timeline errors and character errors. So I've um, mentioned a character by name several times. For example, uh, in this book, Sir Crispian is Sir Crispian Bontui, and he was originally Montui, which is a name it turns out I had already used for a different character. 
and I didn't want him to be related to that character. So I changed the, his last name in this book. And that was a catch that my beta, one, just one of my beta readers caught that. So um, they are good tentative little weasels and I need them desperately <laughs> because, um, yeah. Robert says, do I enjoy or find it easier to write characters whose fashion you like? No, I actually have a much better time writing characters whose fashion I don't like. <laughs> um, uh, the, like, the characters to whom I feel a great affinity fashionably, um, like, like, uh, Countess Nadasti, for example, dresses in the way I would dress if I were a vampire queen, if I were a gothic vampire queen. <laughs> I love her dresses. But, um, but I would much prefer to write Ivy. Now, I'm not saying I wouldn't dress like Ivy, but, uh, Ivy's a lot more fun. So, um, Dimity, for example, wears, um, I, I do wear bright colors, but Dimity wears much flashier jewelry and much sparklier stuff and much brighter colors than I generally would wear. Uh, much floofier, uh, she says with her floof, <laughs> but as a general rule. Um, and she was a joy to write because it was so much fun to write about someone who's so thoughtful about the way color can manipulate human emotion because she's also, you know, an intelligencer and a spy. So she also is a master manipulator of humanity. Um, and she, the one of the ways she does that is with aesthetics. Um, and so it was so much fun to write that. Uh, how do I come up with my characters? Um, I, most of them spring fully formed, I suppose. Uh, some of them are loose allegories for my friends, old friends, friends at different times in their lives. Uh, some of them are ex-lovers, uh, drunk, <laughs> for example. Um, yeah, I pull, like most writers do, I think I pull from my, um, the world around me and some strange part of the back brain zeitgeist that um, who knows where who knows how that develops um, uh, book wants to know if in defiant or fan do we get any pop-ins from prior books uh, side characters yes um, there's a rather important pop-in there are two important pop-ins in the very last uh, couple of scenes of Defy or Defend that I think you guys will be excited to see. Lever wants to, Lavender wants to know if I'm able to get to my office, which is where I am, with the lockdown, lockdown um, issues and if it's causing any work it, um, problems with timing. No, um, I'm actually I'm totally fine. So... Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the drama of the end of last year, I had to move offices unexpectedly, so I now have a new office. My previous office, so I have a remote office. It's in the same city where I live, but it's on the other side of it. It's not a very big city, though. Uh, so uh, my original office was like a big old Victorian building. So you had a key to the front door, and then you opened the front door, and then you went up a sort of grand staircase, and there was my funny tiny little office off to one side. Quirky converted hallway with a strange not-to-code loft. It was a cute little space. Um, so um, the hallway space was shared. So that would not have been ideal. My new office is um, more open air. So there are hallways, but they are like, they're open to the outside elements. They're shielded overhead. There's like transoms, I guess. I don't know the right word. Um, so my front door is the front door to my office, but also to my getting into the building. So no one else is really touching my door handle. Um, and so the only facility that's shared where I might come in contact with people is the bathroom. But, um, and, but no one else is really coming to work in the building, in the whole building. And of the people coming to work in my building, I think all of them are men except for me. I think I am the only pers female personage using the female identified bathroom. And before you ask, no, we do not have gender neutral bathrooms. I did ask, uh, but they were like strange new female shush and go back to your office. Anyway, um, 
But now I'm kind of grateful for that, quite frankly, because uh, all of the men are using the men's restroom and only I am using the women's restroom, so far as I could tell. Um, and that's because the businesses, the, the front-facing businesses that share the building are a nail salon and a hair salon, and they're both closed, and they were mostly staffed by women. Um, it's kind of ironic, actually. It is, um, and is an example of the state of the industry that uh, it is mostly the dudes who are still working and the women who used to work in this building who are clearly not working or working from home. So, yeah, so um, basically, uh, I don't really encounter anybody at all between my house and my office. If I'm biking, I'm biking on prescribed bike lane areas. And if I drive, I leave my house, get into my car, I don't see anybody or encounter anybody. I wear a little mask, wear my gloves, I drive, I park behind my office building, I walk to my front door of my office and don't see anybody, <laughs> and then I go inside. So it's fine, actually. It's really nice. Um, if there were a shower of some kind in this building, uh, it would be a, a way to separate for shelter in place if I needed to from my partner if one of us got sick, but um, I don't think it will be necessary. I think we're we're fine, but it is, it is really nice. I am really lucky that I get a place that is dedicated and mine that is not shared with anybody. Kelly is, is staying at home for all of her work right now, um, which is why I'm boxing up and delivering books and stuff. Um, yeah, uh, but it is really nice to have another place where I can go, where I can, I can leave the house, um, and I'm, I'm super, super lucky to have that right now. Uno wants to know if I ever tried the strawberry jam from Swanton Farms. I think so, and I think it was good, uh, but I don't remember. I'm currently on a damson plum jam, which is rocking my world. Um, I have to say, I love a plum. Plum jam. Moving along, Aline asks... If I've ever considered writing a retelling of a famous story or a fairy tale, well, um, Imogen and Madame LeFou's story, Romancing the Inventor, is a little bit of a Beauty and the Beast kind of retelling. Um, I am not a super fairy tale person. I like them. I like swapped, I like gender swapped and queer fairy tale retellings a lot. It's one of the things I like to read. But I haven't seriously thought of rewriting one. The other thing I've seriously thought of redoing or rewriting is, um, Austin stuff, um, because I love Austin very much, um, or something very, very obscure, a, a super obscure fairy tale, maybe, maybe, um, maybe when I run out of ideas for other things. This is, for those of you who love older literature, this is a cold comfort farm retelling, very loosely, but but pretty obviously if you're familiar with um, Gibbons' work, um, if you like cold comfort farm. That's what I'm drawing on for this book. So I'm obviously not against parodies and retellings. Uh, I just I hadn't really thought about it. Um, the, my problem with fairy tales is often female agency. Um, so I would gender flip if I were going to do, or at least somewhat, uh, in some way, or queer flip if I was going to do a fairy tale, without question. Brie is complimenting my coat. Thank you very much. My uh, sort of wrap coat. It's quite ridiculous and I love it. And it's actually great for traveling because it kind of works like a blanket. Everyone is talking about it being warm where they are. Um, we got a spate of warm weather for a little while, but now it's gotten back to being cold again. And it's very cold in my office building, which is actually one of the reasons I rented it. Because we had such a terribly hot summer last year, and I was so miserable in both my apartment and my office because both of them were old Victorian buildings with top floor units. And they just turn into hot boxes if it gets over like 70 degrees here. Um, so I actually rented this one, which is a lower story unit in a cinder block building, um, you know, 1960s or something with lots of airflow and transom and it, and it is north facing. And so it is cold in the winter, but I'm hoping it will also be cool in the summer. Um, Nicole wants to know if the next Delightfully Deadly is going to be Agatha's book. Um, probably <laughs> I hope so but I don't rule anything out uh, one of the other girls or Felix or 
Pillover or somebody might want to tell their story instead, and then they jump to the front of the queue. Um, my whole reason for writing like this, for changing the way I approach writing fiction to giving myself deadlines and writing for myself a little bit more is just for that reason, so that I don't ever pigeon my, pigeonhole myself into having to write anything. Um, so I think it will probably be Agatha, but I'm not gonna make any promises because I haven't written it yet. Uh, I don't make a promise until I've written the book. Which is why I can promise you that Heroine's Journey and The Enforcer Enigma are coming this year, because they're both written. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, Brie is also asking who gets the next Delightfully Deadly book. Uh, it isn't written, so I make no promises. I'm so evil. Wahaha. Um, ah, Lakshmi, a Lakshmi asks about the earrings that I'm wearing. They are pen nibs with a little, um, gear at the top, and I picked them up at the San Diego Steampunk convention that I was at last year? The year before? Um, which is a fabulous event and I had a great time and they had a really good dealer's room and I bought these. I actually ordered them there. Um, so I have a silver pair that I wear all the time and I basically just went up to her and I was like, do you have brass or gold? Um, but you can check Etsy. I think some Etsy vendors will have them. Um, they're out and about. Robin asks if we're just gonna see the girls from finishing school in the novellas or if we're gonna get anything with the teachers. So I hadn't thought to do the teachers and then you Robin or maybe somebody else um, asked about some of the teachers stories and I do like that idea. Um, if I wrote one of the teachers stories, especially if I wrote like when they were younger or older, I suppose, um, I could write Regency settings um, or something like that. Uh, and that's very exciting to me. So I'm not ruling it out, uh, but I don't have an idea for a story for any of them yet. Amanda wants to know if I will write Lilliput into any of my books. Uh, Lilliput is in my books. Lilliput is footnote, or footnote is Lilliput. Uh, footnote is just a long haired male version of Lilliput. So yes, is the answer. <laughs> Uh, Megan wants to know about Cushiel's Dart. I love the Cushiel's Dart series. I recommend it regularly if uh, you're all right with um, a light BDSM uh, tenor. And uh, the thing that people don't give, Jacqueline Carey is the author of the Cushiel's Dart series. And I do like the original series the best, I have to say. Um, the thing that people don't give Jacqueline Carey enough credit for is she is not only a good writer of character, but she's an excellent uh, battle sequence author. Uh, like Some of her battles in the final book of the series manage to be both sweeping and also incredibly intimate, uh, which is really hard as an author to write. So um, I think she's, she's an excellent author. Um, beautifully drawn, very complicated world building, but also really good at battle sequences, which people don't give her enough credit for, I don't think. All right, we are uh, rind winding down on the hour, so I'm going to ask you to stop asking questions, and I'm going to apologize if I didn't get to your question. It doesn't show me everything, and I don't always see it if we don't get a question mark at the front. I'm going to blow through the last ones, but, but you should stop asking them. Um, but I always try and go back, reread all of the comments, make sure I've replied to any questions that I missed, and um, also if it's a question that I want to answer on a live, I'll sometimes make a note of it and it'll be, it'll be on the next live. There will be another live, don't worry. Heather wants to know who was my hardest or most difficult hero or heroine to write. Percy was really difficult because he's so awkward, but once I got his voice, he was fine. Um, but Prudence was probably the hardest, and that was just because I was discovering something about myself as a writer. So I tried to write Prudence while I was still writing the Finishing School series, and I couldn't do it. She ended up being a very muddled combination of Alexia and Sophronia, and it didn't work. She didn't have a unique voice at all, um, and it totally didn't work. And that was just that I had to learn that I can't write two series at once. I have to write one series and then another one. That's just that if I'm, um, otherwise the main characters get 
weird in my head. That's one of the reasons I write standalones in a shared universe or um, lines of books rather than I don't write as many series anymore and that's just it's just easier for me to immerse myself completely into a character's head and give them one solid book than if I want to write a series I have to take a huge amount of time because what I would what I like to do is just write one book and then the next book and then the next book and then the next book and that is just very very time consuming um, and I learned that with the custard protocol series so yeah, Prudence was the hardest character I've ever had to write, without question. Uh, but that was my own my own darn fault, as it turned out. Book has another question. Um, how would my characters react to our current situation? Uh, I think it would depend on their personalities. Uh, I mean, Arsenic would be out there trying to fix everything. Uh, Percy would be freaking out about it quietly and internally, uh, but hold up reading a book and quite happy about having to stay in one place and just research things all the time, but worried about Arsenic. Um, you know, like everybody would be their usual, you know, eccentric selves, I imagine. Uh, Prudence would probably try and take the entire ship up into the ether and just leave it there. <laughs> you know? Um, it depends on their social sociability and nature. I mean, I think Madame LeFou, for example, would be fine. She'd just retreat to her inventions and invent things. She'd come up with a new ventilator. Some kind of pulmonary ventilator is not the right word. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Carrie asked about the fifth gender. I did, I mentioned that. I'm sorry if you asked the question before I answered it, but uh, it's one of the, second book in that series is one of the ones on my possibilities list. I just haven't decided. But yes, I definitely would like to write more. Rachel wants to know if I'll ever write a poly or polyamorous character or relationship. I am not against it. Uh, pronouns become complicated when there are more than two people in bed together. Uh, and you know I like to take my characters to bed. Uh, but n I'm definitely not against it. it just uh, that character hasn't spoken to me yet. Uh, if it happens, it would probably be in the San Andreas world. And there is a very active poly um, who are primary couple of all of the Kitsune uh, or the Kitsune um, Fox shifter characters in the San Andreas universe are poly. So you do see them. They just haven't been a main character yet. Um, looking through la 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 looks like don't have too many more questions that's excellent um god so many thoughts and ideas for future things for me to write <laughs> man if i ever run out of ideas i'll just come to you um stephanie wants to know if people are reading more because they are home i can't speak to the industry as a whole uh because i'm not in that side of it but I can tell you that uh, people are reading or at least buying a lot of um, books that they feel they should have read, like Steinbeck and stuff like that. And um, uh, people are reading Comfort a little bit more. Uh, so my kind of stuff, romance, uh, escapism and, you know, humor, romantic comedies, funny stuff, that kind of thing is, is seems to be being read a little bit more and um children's children's fiction and literature of course uh because kids are home and we're trying to entertain them so those things are being made more stein wants to know if i wrote fanfic what would i write i would write valdemir fanfic probably for mercedes lucky that was an easy question <laughs> um in fact, I've been asked to contribute to Valdemir anthologies several years running now, and I have a good idea for something that I would write in that universe, but I, it, the request comes in when I have other deadlines and I just haven't been able to do it. Do I have a file with all of my characters organized? No, um, I keep all of my world Bible and character information online now, which can become a problem if you're obsessive because I if you really want to, you can see what I'm working on next because I'll start entering new characters into the world Bible and everything. Um, but I figure if you don't want spoilers, then you shouldn't be actively hunting for them. And <laughs> so I do it anyway, because that's where I keep my information. I need a searchable thing at this juncture because I have so many characters in, in the universes. Uh, this is an interesting question. How do I feel when I write about a character younger in one series and older in the next? 
Um, so, so far, most of the time... Okay, so the Finishing School books are like that. And then I actually started by writing a character older the first time and then younger. The, that was the first direction I went. And that was Madame LeFou. So I wrote her in her 30s in the uh, Parasol Protectorate series. And then I wrote her as a 10-year-old young kid in the... Uh, finishing school series. So I went backwards the first time I did it and I loved it. It was a great experience. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed exploring Madame LeFou before she became jaded. That was very fun for me as an author. Um, so I, I really like it. Um, I, and I like this direction too. I really like taking the characters that you see younger, discovering themselves, forming their initial friendships, discovering their places in the world, discovering what they're good at, which is which is what it is like to be a young adult. That's what it's like to be in high school and early college is you're figuring out yourself, your family, your friendship group, your found family, and your purpose, or what you think might be your purpose. Um, what you're good at and what you do and who you are, that is that is the Bildish Roman, that is the journey of young adult literature. And so it's really fun to then take those characters and write them more confident in themselves and whether all of those things that they thought they learned in high school, as it were, are true or not. Um, are they that good at it? Is this the right path for them? Um, have they found themselves, their places in the world, their identities? How have their have their friendships lasted? Those sorts of the sorts of questions. Um, and it's fun to do that as a, it's really fun to do that as an author. Um, I enjoy it immensely. If Dimity was magically transported to a modern era, what decade would she fall in love with? The twentieth and twenty-first century. I think Dimity would love the nineteen twenties. Um, and she might get to experience it if she lives long enough. Um, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, I think, I think she's, I think Dimity is in the sort of free love range, so she might like the 60s quite a bit too, um, more than sort of the straight-laced 50s or something. Um, yeah, so I'm thinking, thinking the raging 20s, um, or the, or the, the free love 60s. Uh, <laughs> Dick asks, <laughs> if I've ever punished one of my acquaintances in one of my books, yes, yes I have. I've also accidentally done it. Uh, so there is a very minor character in the first San Andreas books called Lexi Blanc, who is a werewolf country music rock singer. Um, and she's really minor. She's like mentioned twice. She is uh, based on an a friend of mine helped me to write her and then um, I needed her to be a bad guy <laughs> in the upcoming book. <laughs> so unfortunately uh, um, a, a character that was supposed to be a nice character, a nice sort of ode to this friend of mine turned out to be a complete nitwit. <laughs> So I, I had to apologize to them to be like, Alex, I'm so sorry, you're a character. Mm. Uh, I'm afraid she's gone bad. Brittany says, has cosplay ever inspired a character? Oh, yeah, um, definitely uh, cosplay at steampunk events has inspired moments with my characters. Um, because the whimsy of steampunk events very much has always informed me as an author. Uh, I find it extremely appealing. So the strange gadgetry. Um, I don't think I've ever actually taken a, a character I've seen portrayed and then stuck it in my books, but I've definitely seen a gadget that someone's done or a piece of clothing or a piece of attire and thought, oh, that's really fun. Um, what would it be like if it existed in my universe? Um, I definitely find steampunk, live steampunk, interacting with punkers um, very inspiring and very exciting. Alrighty, my dears, it looks like there's still a few more questions. I'm trying to get to them quickly. Uh, Anya asks, who's my favorite Austin story or character? Um, so I am pretty pedantic in that I really love um, Pride and Prejudice. It's, it's still my favorite Austin story. I know that that makes me pretty normal. Uh, you will never persuade me to persuasion. Most of my friends really love persuasion. I don't like Anne Elliot at all. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know I'm upsetting people out there. Um, 
I actually really love, in Love and Friendship, I like Lazy Lady Susan a lot. I like an anti-hero. I always am sad that Austin never got to write an anti-hero. It would have been really fun to see her tackle that particular archetype. She never did, uh, and I'm sad about that. <laughs> uh, so Lady Susan is probably one, but she's very underformed in the, you know, in the notes. So if you're asking me in, in, in Austin story, who do I love? Mr. Collins, I'm a huge fan of Mr. Collins and Mr. Elton, both of them, because I like a pedantic, um, I like it when Austin is poking fun at the establishment. Uh, Lady Catherine de Bourgh, similarly. I like those kinds of Austin characters. I think she's at her most fun when she's subverting the class system by writing very interesting things about the idle rich, for example. So those are some of my favorite characters. If you're asking me whom I identify with as an Austin character, it's probably Eleanor, but, um, Maybe Lazy Susan a bit too, and of course Fanny Price because I'm a writer. But um, I'm I, Fanny Price always seems a little downtrodden to me. Robert wants to know if I ever write a book with queer only characters. The San Andreas books are all queer only. I don't think there are any straight characters in those books, or if they are straight, they won't be straight for long. <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, I think the fifth gender. I don't think has any. Uh, in my future, no one's really straight anymore. Sorry, <laughs> straight folks. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So there's two, two series. All queer. Yay! All right. Oh, there's another question. Oh, Mademoiselle Geraldine's backstory. That might be fun. That's a cool idea. Look at me just collecting ideas from you all. Uh, back, back story for the Finnish school teachers. There's that. Um, if I did, they would be in the Delightfully Deadly series of novellas and novels. Um, I keep saying novels because this book is technically novel length. It's kind of Pulp Fiction length, but it's, it's not novella length. So, like, I can't say just novella. I can't use the word just novella anymore. I have to say novels. All right, I think we're gonna wind it down soon. Ah, Britta wants to know if my finishing school will be translated. It has been translated into French and German. Um, I don't know what language you're interested in, Britta. Mm, I am thinking Britta, uh, Scandinavian language, perhaps? Um, as a general rule, the best thing you can do if you want something translated is talk to the translator of my other stuff. Uh, but the countries are very interesting about what they will translate. So the Northern European countries in Germany, uh, or the Northern European countries in general, uh, don't like young adults as much as some of the other countries. So my young adult series has been translated into like Turkish, but it's never been translated into Swedish, I don't think. Um, whereas my adult stuff, uh, Swedish but not Turkish. So like different parts of the world are interested in different genres of books. And because I write technically different genres, not all of my books are always all translated into all languages. And also, uh, if a translated work doesn't sell well enough, they're not going to translate the rest of the books in that series. So you will also get the situation where like the first or second books are translated and then not the rest of the series, for which I apologize, but there's nothing I can do about it. Um, and that's because they are very expensive. Translations are really, really expensive to do because they have to buy the rights to publish the book from me, and then they have to pay a translator to translate it, and then they have to pay a copy editor to copy edit it again. So like redundancy there. Um, so that's why translations are not as common as we would like, I'm afraid. No more graphic novels. Oh, not that I know of anyway. I'm not opposed to it, just haven't had much interest. And if you want to read more about the graphic novel situation, you can Google uh, Gail Carriger, where is the last manga? Um, Britta wants to know about soap after Sophronia. You get a peek at what's going on with them in the Custard Protocol series and in Meet Cute. Um, and, ah, uh, and in um, maybe, maybe. In, because, of course, they're not connected whatsoever, uh, the San Andreas series. I'm not saying you're going to see Soap, but you get a little bit, maybe get a little bit about about him. Maybe just a little, little tiny bit. Northanger Abbey is my least favorite Austin. 
Uh, I love gothics and I love the gothic tropes and I like that she's lampooning them and I think it is hilarious, but I think it does show her immaturity as an author. Stacy wants to know when the heroine's journey comes out. Like the Enforcer Enigma, I'm not quite sure on that, but it will be this year. Um, and yeah, I would hope, uh, she says that as a high school writing teacher, she'd think her students would like it. And I hope so. I, I wrote it in such a way that it should be very accessible. I also wrote it for readers because I think it's fun for you guys to get an insight into how authors write, but also why your taste is the way it is. Like, oh, why do I gravitate towards these kinds of books or these kinds of books? Because I think that has to do with the heroine's journey and the hero's journey. So um, the the nonfiction book is ri ri written <laughs> very accessibly, but also with an idea um, towards readers of, of different ages, um, but also not just writers, but also readers, so that you guys maybe would find it interesting, I hope. Alrighty, I think that's a good place to stop because I'm about to go back to working on the heroine's journey <laughs> next week. Um, actually, well, and the Enforcer Enigma. So yes, on that note, um, it has been a joy talking to you all. Thank you all for your fantastic questions as ever and for taking time out of your very busy day to uh, spend it with me, drinking tea, welcoming this book into the world. I, man, I hope you guys like it. Um, I hope it cheers you up. I hope it makes you feel happy and um, silly and dancey and ridiculous. And I hope you crave tea and sweets and all the crazy food things that I always make you crave when I write a book. Because <laughs> that's what I do. Um, and yeah, it's out tomorrow. Yeah, crazy, crazy to think about. Um, I love you so much. Uh, enjoy your reading, enjoy your tea, enjoy your mornings and evenings and afternoons, and I will see you next month. Uh, and hopefully I'll have more to tell you about the release dates for the next two books.